Here we're recording. So welcome Wolfgang Fenning, who I've gotten to know over the years as a member of the Food System Roundtable and through support that Fenning's had of the Guelph Organic Conference and so many other events and, uh, and activities and community engagement along the way. Um, and so Wolfgang's going to tell us a bit about what he does and a bit about the, the whole operation, which is farming and wholesaling and um, and give us a snapshot of what the food system looks like from, from your perspective. So thank you for joining us. No problem. Good morning, everyone. Uh, excuse my background here. Uh, I'm in my little office at work with all the clipboards on the wall. Um, Fenning's Organic Vegetables is a, an organic vegetable farm. We started working here in 1981 and starting from farmer's market, little odds and ends. And today it's now November 1, it was 40 years uh, that I came to Canada. You can tell I'm, uh, English is not my first language. I was 18 when I came to Canada. Anyway, uh, this industry is consumer driven. So we always adapted to the needs of the market and the needs of the market asked us to provide more food. And today uh, we employ, it's about 130, 150 people in the summer, in the winter 50. And we service 200 stores per week uh, with food that we grow and other farmers grow and we package and distribute. So it's kind of a multi-level uh, business starting with farming at our farm and other farms. And then we have harvest teams, packaging, uh, washing, grading, because we grow all the greens like parsley bunches, dandelion bunches, chard, kale, broccoli, but we also do onions and carrots and potatoes and beets around things. So we have all these different packing lines and they package all this food and then the distribution part of the business um, with six trucks. We stay in Southern Ontario here. Uh, we service all the stores and we also import food uh, from the US, California, South America to round out uh, the, the program so we can offer a full program. <clears throat> we farm about 700 acres um, between vegetables, some processing food crops, and uh, some grain for cover crops. So that's what we do. My role is the field work to coordinate all the field people, the different teams. There are six teams doing different things between, uh, in the spring it starts with planting, weeding, the bunching team, we call it, are the people that uh, do the parsley, kale, uh, dandelion, all those things. It's a quite a large group of people that are with a harvest aid are in the field every day and they bunch, harvest and make bunches out of all these things. And then that comes in and gets um, received and cooled and iced and labeled so that it enters the system. When the machinery breaks down, I need to coordinate how to fix that and so on. So yeah, um, I don't know if there are questions. Yeah, or oh, trucking, sometimes drivers don't come to work. So then you come out in the morning or you get that phone call, uh, a truck is in the yard, but no driver. And then within like 15 minutes, you have to be on the road for a 10 hour shift and coordinate all the teams from being on the road. So, um, you know, ladies are usually better than men in multitasking, but this situation forces us to practice multitasking. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to share a little bit over the 40 years how the business has changed and how also how like the food industry from your perspective has changed? 
uh, the, the interest in organic food increased dramatically over the 40 years. So it was not hard to adapt to larger volume. It was harder that it, when you adapt to larger volume, you outgrow your infrastructure and processes before they're paid off. So you're constantly cash strapped because you need to upgrade, make improvements, set up bigger buildings and so on. And that usually is very hard to, ca to cash flow. <clears throat> Acreage, we found more land over time, but usually that came our way. People came and said, look, can you farm my field? I want my land farmed organic. So that was doable. Um, labor was always a bit of an issue. And back in the early 80s, uh, there was a large new immigrant group out of Vietnam, the Laos people. And they knew farming, so those people usually don't speak English. And they came and started to work on our farm. And then we had uh, Central American people join. We, uh, oh, and with these immigrant groups, it's usually the older people that work on farms. The younger ones, they blend in and don't start working on farms. So as soon as the Vietnamese people started to retire, not, nobody else came. So then we had Central American people join. We had people from Eastern Europe join. As, as these immigrant waves came, uh, the older folks that don't speak English can't go work in many places. They go find a way to work on the farm. But on a farm, we are also a legitimate business and need staff that you can talk to. You need, you need people that have training. It's very, very hard to run a business and supply large companies that have big demands with a workforce that you can talk to. Uh, we have Punjabi people working with us and this is wonderful, but a lot of the people, they live in Canada for 10 years or longer, and they can't say hi. You know, so we learned to say good morning in their language to to build that bridge. And I, over the years, learned to say like good morning in the first five words in at least five or six or seven different languages that work for us. We have Somali people working. We have Eritrea people that speak, speak Arabic. Um, the Punjabi people, Central America, Asia, and, and that you, it, it, it helps. And uh, even relationships develop between the different ethnic groups working. That's kind of nice to watch sometimes how they make jokes with each other and but can't speak much. Yeah. That started and also us to, to uh, work with uh, people from Jamaica. <clears throat> we started with, gen, with 10 people from Jamaica and now we are, I think 35 or 40 people from Jamaica. And this is very good because it, it's a stable workforce that lives on the farm, that is with us, that is very engaged. Um, it, it helps the people bring money to Jamaica because Jamaica doesn't have much to export other than labor. Um, it makes the people happy here. Uh, they, they spend up to eight months with us. Some people are going on a two-year program now. There were some questions, Stephanie, you had regarding the migrant workers yeah i don't know if um, emma wants to share any questions because i think it came from her and i know she was also asking about employment standards we were asking angie about that last week too and she was saying it's a bit laughable the employment standards for agricultural workers but i don't know if you have any comments about that maybe you want to unmute emily and <laughs> and and ask those her, questions her. hi yeah um i had the questions um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could touch on employment standards. Um, 
So for this class, we all have a big group project. And one of the things that we're focusing on is kind of like, we're calling it people care. And so how do we care for the people that provide us food? And so I was just wondering like what your take is um, with your farm specifically on that. We are very community oriented, family oriented people. We like community, we like friends. Um, we brought those uh, 10 men in back in 2005 and most of them are with us still. Since then, many new people joined. And yes, they are away for eight months from home. Uh, if, there are many different ways you can look at it. If you look at it from a money point of view, uh, they make between five and 10 times the money here per day or per hour than they make when they are home. But that's not all. The people are, are very eager to travel and they're very eager to work under any kind of condition in order to get that pay so that they can send money home and send their kids to school and do all those things. We as a family like to still make life as family-like as possible and so that it's not work only. And the, the Canadian system back in the 50s, it established the program for the Caribbean uh, nations to, to come to Canada to work. And there's about 150,000 people, I think, coming every year to Canada to work. In California, it's Mexican people. And you wouldn't have an apple or an orange or a grape if those people wouldn't be coming to work because Canadian people don't pick apples and California people don't pick oranges and grapes. That's just a fact. Uh, <clears throat> so those people cut broccoli, they do all this work. And the Canadian system developed the, the, the contracts and everybody knows what they're going in for right from the beginning. The US copied the Canadian system, but they copied it very poorly. And it's not that well of a functioning system. The downside to this workforce system is um, it, it's multi-leveled. We do have people in the country that, have, that are afraid of these people or when our people for the first time came to the farm and they went shopping in the little town here and they went into a store, people called the police and said, oh, what's going on? And then what the police officer offered and uh, suggested take the people to all the businesses and introduce them. So we did this and that ended that problem. And now the people are so the workers are so part of the community that when I go to the bank in the winter time, the bank ladies ask, hey, when are, men come, when are the men coming back? Whenever they come in to deposit their check, it's so lively in the bank. So there's also uh, good, good things. Um, and so we need to, on a very fine, subtle level, uh, tweak these things so that some of these prejudices that we in this country have um aren't there and it's it's human nature we expose people we point the finger at people uh and every year we do it in a different way you know right now during this pandemic we point fingers at one group and the other group points the finger at the other group and there's all these emotions coming up and we, you you have that when different people come in or they are afraid that they're taking the job away and we tell uh, Ministry of Labor uh, uh, when, when, when they do the paperwork, they basically say you have to bring Canadian people to the job, not, not migrant workers. And we say, good, send every Canadian you have, but please also send the Jamaicans because every farmer knows that the Canadians don't show up or if they show up, they show up for one day or two days. And it's very rare that somebody really sticks around. And because Canadian would call it, Canadians would call this 
may be a stepping stone in the career. For the Jamaicans, this is a career. And there is the difference. If you consider something your career, you put all your engagement to it, then you will be able to per perform at work. And we're not asking people to work hard. Uh, but if it's, if it's just an inconvenient stepping stone in life that you come to a farm because you for the moment don't have anything else, that'll show in the engagement. Can I ask, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how do you set yourself apart from the other um, employers that hire migrant workers? Because there's far too many atrocities and issues that we see and that often makes me have not um, a prejudice, but a bias against in purchasing food that's used migrant labor. Um, specifically for myself, it's tomatoes. We saw this documentary about leaving to Ontario and the working conditions and what they described in the documentary is nothing like what you're talking about. Those people were isolated from the regular community and they were isolated from any public and social services. It seems as if you created a community and there's a wider exposure and transparency that the people that you're hiring are clearly happy or are seeming to be happy. And um, obviously their working conditions are such that they can access the communities very easily without too many barriers, which is a big issue with a lot of migrant employers is that they are able to keep their employees well away from other communities. So how do you, uh, when you're marketing your products, distinguish yourself from those others so that somebody like me who might have a bit of a bias or a concern with, uh, with migrant labor, because I, I do appreciate all of the benefits of them, uh, you know, learning food skills and education and being able to develop the beginning of a career. And, you know, like you said, they're sending money more back than they could otherwise. But on the same time, when we look at their pay compared to what other Canadians are making, it doesn't always feel fair. So I was wondering also, how does your pay scale compare to those in Leamington where they can pay them $10 an hour or let them work for you know, 10, 20 hours a day or whatever, no real rules and those sorts of things. Um, but it doesn't sound like that from you. So that's why, how do I know the difference? Okay, those are good points. Number one, the migrant workers have to be paid at least minimum wage. Number two, the employer pays for the flight, provides housing, provides shopping trips. The contract requires one shopping trip per week so they can buy food. The employer has to take them uh, to, to, for shopping. So there are hidden costs for us. Jamaican workers cost more than Canadian minimum employer employed workers because of the hidden, the back, background costs that are part of it. To be very frank, we have more rednecks in the country than we think. Also on the shopper end, because they don't always know the whole story or what they hear is what the news brings and news need to bring exciting stories and they need to exaggerate things and so on. So I know there are people out there that live in the back country, far away, there may be a redneck and they might have a prejudice, but they want the people to work. But if anybody is a little bit smart and business oriented, you know, you get way more out, if you wanna call it that, out of an employee, if you have him on your side than if he's not on your side. And that's one thing we always learned, and, and I grew up like that, that when you have employees, you don't look down on them. You never place yourself above them. I may be the owner of the company, but at the other end, I'm the lowest servant of it all. I have to go in and sweep the floor. I have to shovel the snow. I walk through the building and help the teams that they can function. And I would never uh, put that in the mind to have that difference. Uh, that's very important. And large core corporations that run the big greenhouses, 
there is there are many many people working there it's a it's a corporate business it's not a family business it's it doesn't have that personal touch towards the workers um they have provided what the law requires and the Canadian and the Caribbean communities developed the conditions and it's a very well laid out program. It's a book that has all the conditions where the worker knows what he needs to provide and what the employer needs to provide. And if they just stick to the book, which is a very administrative practice, you know, administration, if you have a big office and you give one person here, you are the HR person, make this work, then they take the book and they follow the book. And what I find at work, it's very, very hard for especially young people to give and take. They always need lines like on the street, you have a, a, a line on the right and a line on the left and you drive in the middle. Well, that's not creative. You're just being a follower. If you are able to drive using the lines, but then you go in life and see the conditions and you have a little bit of ability to distinguish, can I take a risk or do I better not take the risk? And that is uh, that young people need to learn when they go out into the world, follow the line, that's basic, but to go above it, and give when it does, you know, and when you be friendly to these people or you let them uh, go more often shopping. Our, our workers over the years, we provide a, at least four or five vans and they are supposed to go shopping once a week, but they can go shopping every day if they want. We don't really control it. Sometimes we say to the men, I said, look, if you want to drive to Kitchener, and it, just because one person needs to go to Walmart, just be mindful that for that van to go to Kitchener and come back is $10 on fuel. And you went for some toilet paper to Walmart. We suggest you put four or five people in a van and then you go shopping. So we're not stopping it, we're allowing it, but we do have to sometimes go to the people and say, you know, we don't have money like crazy. We've been a very struggling business for many years because of cost is running away. It's out of control and we can't, we, we can't control our selling prices because that's manipulated by the, by the industry. So we're caught between a rock and a hard plate. And if you wanna keep this life going of living here on the farm, be mindful how you, how you use the vehicles, but uh, we, you know, we, it, that's, we are not uh, a handout thing. Would it be safe to say then it's about scale and the family aspect for you that like you're sort of saying at the corporate bigger level, yeah, you can just follow the documents, but it's clear you're going beyond the document, giving them a lot of freedom and, and community and providing the uh, infrastructure for that, uh, like yes. providing a van. So would you say that maybe if I'm now as a consumer, I should try to find if a smaller farm has migrant workers, I probably shouldn't be concerned about the conditions for them more so if I was buying from a big industrial manufacturer that uses migrant workers. That's usually the case. Um, but, you know, if you work at Toyota, if you work at whatever big factories, life is a drag. And at the end of the day, no matter how attractive the job is, a routine sets in, we're all bus drivers or dump truck drivers. Or if I'm a pilot and I work for an airline and I fly from one point A to point B and back and point A, point B and back. And at the end of the day, it gets all boring or we find some other value in life and in the job and satisfaction in the job that can motivate us through the day and we get together with other workers and no matter how weird the moment is you could be in a prisoner of war camp for 10 years i know people that spend 10 years in a prisoner of war camp or in a refugee camp in somalia for five years young people or one employee worked for us for miramar he spent 20 years in a, in a refugee camp and Canada took him out of there and brought him to Canada. And, you know, 
you can either sit there and spiral down out of control or you can find some other things even in those situations and those people that did not spiral out of control are the ones that survived this and built relationship and made life experience and learned things and so on i i you know we're food people and we i have this as a personal interest to always try to to see some value that's being created it could be it's not money money value it's life experience value um i had a grandmother that went through life and lost everything uh between family members husband farm walked away from everything when the communist world came you know you have a choice to go bitter over it or not and this my grandmother did not go bitter over this and found found things in life that can carry you through difficult times and we right now are living in difficult times all the everybody's getting the rug pulled out from under him everybody is being forced to reveal himself or one way or another people or groups or governments or structures are all revealing themselves not because they want to it's because the life situation in this current moment is pulling the mask away from everything that is there and uh, we are we have to really look inside or we're being challenged inside with our emotions and judgmental things and many things that but this is the the, the moment that the entire world is living in right now there are some cosmic influences we're going from the age of pisces to the age of aquarius which is about a 2000 year period that has just ended and a new one is just starting and part of our age of aquarius is that everything is being revealed all old structures are crumbling new structures are coming and the young generation is part of the new and the old systems don't work anymore but old systems don't give up without a battle they want to hang on to their status quo or or methods and the young people don't function by those old systems they function by new ones and the entire world has to learn to adapt to that um one thing I wanted to mention is the, the migrant workers every year have to go through the process of paperwork and medical check and police check and all those things like any other immigrant into Canada. So uh, I came to Canada in 1981. I needed medical check, police check, whatever checks they needed to be. And these men come every year and they need this every year. So the Canadian government has a track record of police checks annually on workers for 10, 15 years. And that should, in my opinion, be adequate to, allow, to give those people permanent residency. That's, the, that's one thing that I would like to say to the big system and say, guys, you have the information on hand. Just give those people a permanent residency. They, some of them will run away and work in construction and will not work on farms anymore. But a lot of the men will be able to come in, work for the summer and travel back home in the winter anyway. So it would be very low, it would be a very low risk thing for the Canadian government to, to give these people permanent residency. It would make things so much easier on an administrative level. The Canadian system has to em employ so many people just to fi finish the paperwork or fill out the paperwork that was done for 10 times already. So, you know, that's one thing I would really suggest they, they could do. But then some workers you lose, they go and work on construction because that pays more. But the thing is, farming would love to pay more, but the consumer doesn't want to pay more for the food. Do you see? I don't know the, like the term social economy, like uh, just in terms of like shifting business away from business as usual and the kind of alternative structures. I, I mean, I know Fennings is, has a great reputation for supporting lots of 
initiatives. I mean, Guelph Organic Conference comes to mind as a big one, but I know you provide lots of other support for alternative. We, we do, and yet at the end of the day, out of the 200 stores we serve, there, it's wonderful to work with all those people. But they, when they can buy from California for a couple cents cheaper, only last year during the pandemic uh, were we a little bit more appreciated for being local. And it's consumer driven. It goes down to the consumer and every each one of you out here has to watch when you're going shopping or when you're going shopping yourself. You have a bundle of banana. There's a bit of a browner one with a bit of a nick and the other bundle is all nice. Which one do you take? You feel sorry for the one that's brown and take it so that it's off the shelf or did you reach for the nice one? Right there is where the where where it's important to be community oriented and help the system along. When there's an apple that has a nick that stays till the end. Our people, when we take coffee, we, we make coffee for 150 people every day and, and we take it to the fields wherever they are. And when, when the cookie jar or the cookie tray has a broken cookie, that cookie stays till the very end. Nobody takes a split in half cookie. They only take the complete ones. Just a little observation I make every day I take, I take coffee to the teams. Yeah. Why not take a half a cookie? Help <laughs> it along and take it out of the system. No, they take the full ones. Mm -hmm. And that attitude at consumer level, shopping level, drives the store to kick his suppliers for best quality. Yeah. Wolfgang, I'd have, well, please jump in the rest of the class. If you have questions, you can unmute or you can um, put a question in the chat. Um, but I thought this might be a good segue to asking for your perspectives on, well, both on like food waste, you know, in the food retail business and also just on your experience. I know you had some pretty negative experiences with Loblaws in the past and just kind of how you see yeah, your 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 take on on big big box food retail. The the biggest food waste, or the most impactful food waste, is what people have on the plate, or it is the food that made it all the way through the entire supply chain into your household through your fridge onto your plate, and you're not eating it. Because when we have a field of lettuce and it's bolting and we're deciding not to cut it compared to that food track getting harvested, cooled, iced, packaged, packaging material bought. The packaging material comes from Florida because they grow a lot of wood down there. They make the boxes. Uh, the food being shipped and transporting like Shipping food takes a lot, a lot more fuel than growing it in the field. It takes a tractor fuel to run work the field, but that's minimal compared to the fuel for, the, for transportation. Uh, and then sending it through a store, through the infrastructure of a store into your car and then driving home. That's the most expensive transportation part because that box of cereal you drove for, if, if you look at the, the, the fuel burned per mile in a truck, while the truck is full, is much more efficient. But the, the, the most inefficient way of transportation is from the store to your home because you don't have so much product in it. And then it goes through your house. And by the time you put it on your plate and then, and then not eat it, means a lot of fuel was wasted and money was wasted and packaging was wasted and and uh, labor wasted at store level for something that at the end gets thrown out so this is why in our opinion the biggest food waste issue in the country is the food we don't eat and the statistics says about 40 percent of what we buy does not get eaten so food we throw away on the farm gets composted and gets used to make fertilizer for the next year. Some of it can be further processed through the processing industry, but sometimes it can't, but we don't see it as a loss. 
yes, it's making a little, it, it's making a detour. It grew into food that goes back to make compost to go back on the land. So that's a closed circle. But what you usually, what you throw out in your, in your household, now they have green bins. It's getting, it, they're trying to divert it from landfill. But before all that would go to landfill, which is not a closed system. So that's the food waste thing. The, the industry usually is pretty good in finding uh, at, at packaging level, for example, most of our carrots go for other purposes when they don't go into a two pound bag. Uh, but then some still get thrown out, they go for animal feed or we make compost. So we always have a, have a destination for it. We're not dumping it on a pile, let it get stinky. Um, what was the second question? Um, I just kind of your take on um, on big box retail food retailers and how they. Oh know. yeah, yeah. For many years, you know, if you take to make to make it more simple, go back to the airline industry. Uh, you can fly a passenger in a in a big plane for 3.5 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. And you're flying at 900 kilometers per hour. If you drive a car, you are taking at least 10 liters per 100 kilometers to drive that car. So you're driving, flying in a big plane, basically you are flying at a third of what a car's fuel consumption would be. However, if you put four people in a car, then it doesn't take much more fuel, but it, it gets divided by four people, then it would be better even. But that scale of economics, or if you learn to think like that, is what the supermarkets used to get efficient. And, this, and it started at, at a competition thing. Whoever outcompetes the other is the one who survives. It's like the food chain, the bigger it's the smaller. This is how the world works. And back in the day, it was little country stores. And then one guy wanted to become bigger. So what they do is they try to de uh, develop buying power. They make a couple more stores. Then they go to the vendor and say, look, I have three stores. I'm buying more volume. I want a better price. And then the vendor says, well, but I still have to go to three locations. So then they put in a distribution center. And then a vendor can go to a distribution center with a full truckload of food, unload in one location and go back home. Then he can give a much better price because of less expenses. Then the store combines all the different vendors product again onto a truck, which is full and sends one truck to one store full. So you have a, a very high efficiency on expenses and fuel consumption per pound of product, if you want to call it that way. So a supermarket has a much, much lower inbound cost for any product coming into the store by that system. And that made them uh, be able to advertise our sugar or diapers or flour or whatever it is, is only costing so much. So they're handing on the savings in order to be cheaper than the competitor. And then the consumer reads the flyers. And what do you do when you read the flyer? You compare the flyers and then you go to the cheaper one and then you go for five or 10 cents cheaper, sometimes quite a bit further, but you're not looking at your own fuel consumption. And then you're chasing those flyer items. And the consumer is being studied by the advertising about the psychological advertising and is being actually manipulated and driven by the industry. There, there's a good book out that explains how the masses are being manipulated to buy the things they don't need, sometimes not even cheaper, but they may, are made believe that they're buying it cheaper. What are those rewards cards for, right? <laughs> yes. And so, this made the big box stores bigger and bigger and bigger. 
and therefore they got more efficiency and therefore they're flying, they're, they're doing it cheaper. And so it's consumer driven and we as human beings are being driven. We are not in the driver's seat. If we're not watching ourselves, we are being driven by the industry by to be consumers. And we are part of the chain that goes around and drives this whole system. It's not yeah. sustainable. It's not environmentally friendly, but we're, we are being manipulated to buy the things we don't need maybe. Hmm. And they're very big stores. They do that. This is how it works. And I remember a while back, Wolfgang, when the Sobeys on Iron Needles opened up. And I think that you talked about them doing something a little more, a little unique in the sense that they were able to, um, to supply more local products, like to feature local cheeses or I don't know, other, other products, which was very unusual because most big box stores, as you said, food retailers are only getting from these big distribution centers and only huge volumes. Do you have any updates on that? For those very large companies to have control over the workforce internally, when you allow each store to do their backdoor buying, deals get made, bribes get made, the big head office doesn't have control over and those they're not, it, 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 it just causes problems. So this is when Loblaws and everybody stopped backdoor buying, unless it is something ethnic for that neighborhood that they allow the store to bring it in because for small items to go through the distribution center doesn't work. It gets lost in those centers. They have their own problems there at that level. So they allow backdoor buying, but only unique items. Um, Sobeys has gotten quite good in managing smaller units through the distribution centers. Farm Boy has its own distribution center and has started with a very unique uh, mindset and Sobeys bought Farm Boy, but is not integrating it into the Sobeys head office. They're letting it run parallel because Farm Boy has such a unique way of doing it and Sobeys realized the value and they're letting it go. So for us, it's very good to work with Farm Boy, but also with Sobeys. And with our local organic industry in getting larger and uh, and more interest being there, most large supermarket chains now have an organic program through the distribution center and they're basically all buying from us. And it's working either through backhaul or through us delivering the DC. But the system is what it is, you know, you can't, uh, you, you can't change that. It has its value, it has its downsides. And we, over the years, learned to work with it, uh, to negotiate in it, to, to play the system. Yeah, I think Ben has a question for you. Yes. Hi, yeah, I wanted to ask, we were doing some reading uh, to prepare for uh, this and it was one of them was saying that the demand for organic food has not always been so consistent, which kind of leaves the farmers in a difficult position because of all the, the kind of like what they're expecting the demand to be wasn't always met. They're saying something about how 10 years ago there's a real uh, issue or something with that. Is that have you experienced that at all on your farm? The supermarkets like to say in the winter time when they have a meeting with you oh we're going to need all this product and they're making sure you grow it so they get supply and then in the summer it usually they usually way over project and then you get stuck and hung so it's our job to to find homes for the product or if you have to lose it you lose it in the field that's the most efficient way mm. So when we had um, Angie speaking with us, Angie Cook last week, she was talking about a lot of different ways that she was able to um, divert and, uh, and, and give away or sell at wholesale prices um, to different, um, you know, uh, food hamper programs or other ones in the city. Do you engage in anything like that? A little bit, but usually not so much. 
we we have we have we're working at a different scale and we our sales department usually like if we're on our farm we end up with a lot of kale and we tell the sales department there's a lot of product coming up in about two, a week or two and then they go to work and find homes for it but it's usually volume that uh, we can't call a food bank or call a local box company and say, look, there's 10 pallets of kale coming. They use 10 boxes. Um, so we are working at a different scale and therefore we, we usually don't interfere with, like I, what Angie does makes total sense for her, her business scale. and the way she works. It, that's the way to do it. Yeah. But um, we usually try to, because of the scale we, we work on, um, enter the market in a different place and in a place where, for example, Angie's business model wouldn't be able to go to. There's not the infrastructure or the volume available. Yeah. So we have connections now that we can, um, can call on and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and then you try a few other ones and sometimes product gets sent to the US. There's usually good demand in the US, uh, especially along the East Coast, because we are so much closer than California. And California mm -hmm. is the biggest producer. So uh, if we send it East, it's maybe if a quarter of shipping cost than it would be from California. So we, we try to make our overflow product go to the United States or Quebec. Yeah. But Quebec has their own very loyal, uh, their own organic uh, growing, but also a very loyal consumer base. So we don't force product or undercut price undercut going into Quebec because Quebec is loyal to the, the consumer is very loyal to the farmer. In Ontario, this is not quite so, and we wish it would be like in Quebec. So we play very well with the Quebec farmers as well as uh, consumer base, because we also bring product from Quebec if we don't have it. So we, we deal uh, through several provinces in Ontario to make product flow. It's like water, it always flows to the lowest point. Yes. Anyone else wanna jump in here? I've got like a comment. Um, so going back to like the migrant workers, um, where I live here, there's like a bunch of Christmas trees, Christmas tree farms. So um, there's a lot of migrant workers that come here in the summer specifically for like the trimming of the trees. And then like right now cutting the trees down and that. Um, and when I was younger, my uncle would always say that like, you know, in my day, um, all of them in high school would work at these farms and now it's all migrant workers because no Canadian high school students want to do that because it's like long hours and it's hot and it's in, in the sun outside all day all summer. Um, so it's kind of like what you were mentioning about you can't get Canadians to go do that job so why complain that we're hiring people from not Canada to do it. Um, but yeah so that and then I had a question about um, We've talked a lot about relocalizing the food system. So kind of like focusing more on smaller scale type food production and then local food distribution. Um, just wondering kind of what your thoughts on that are. Like you're obviously a larger scale. Um, so you're kind of shipping it more to Ontario and out of Ontario. Um, but like that's just like a way towards sustainability. Um, yeah. You know, like I say, when I was 18, I came to Canada. I knew farming. I grew up on an organic farm. My father was an organic farmer. We went to a farmer's market in Kitchener and sold a little bit of food. And you are there for like half a day and you sell food for $150. Um, that was not enough to to make a living on and my dad bought the farm we didn't have to pay off the farm but if you go back to economics you need to live you need to pay off the farm 
this business that we are in would have never ever been able to pay itself off back in those early days. It took six years to break even back in those days. Um, then when I finished, I went to high school for a little bit. I was always mechanical. My dad was a mechanical. We were machinery and tractor people and we grew food. And there were like three health food stores in Toronto, the Carrot, Baldwin Food and Karma Co-op and Noah's Natural Foods, four. So in 1983, I thought I'll drive to Toronto and see if they want food from us. So from then on, we serviced those stores and we still do today, twice and three times a week. So for basically almost 40 years, we've been servicing those stores and inc it increased. And what happened was we were able to sell in a, in a few hours a full van load of food in Toronto than at the farmer's market where we, there was not the interest. So what I wanna say with this is back in 1982, 1983, for us to make a living, to do what we need to do, uh, we had to focus on delivering to stores. There was no CSA, that people would not come to the farm. All of this was not there. So then that put us in a certain position that we focused on supplying those businesses. And as they became more, we focused on supplying all the stores as they came. That put, the, uh, that put a certain direction into this business. Then when the CSAs came, I saw that's a wonderful system. It's one of the ele most elegant systems there is. But our farm had established already with infrastructure. We have big coolers, we have packaging equipment, we have actual packaging material, the design of the bags. You know, if you take a new carrot bag, if you want to redesign, that's a $10,000 investment and each little bag is five or six cents. And the cardboard boxes are $3 a piece. And like, if you are setting up a large um, supply chain, all the ingredients needed, or imagine you're building a car, you need all these parts. If you have one part missing, you can't build the car. We had to compile all these little components into being able to put a bunch of parsley on the shelf with a tag, with a lot number, with everything in place in order to make it happen. Now the CSA develop and I'm in love with it, but I can't really change because all this other effort in setting up was made. Plus we're serving an industry that would not go to the farm to buy um, at a CSA. There are millions of customers and consumers that live in a city that can only go to their local Sobe store. And we're providing service to those people. And there are many other farms that are doing the CSA program that even get supply from us when they don't have it. So we are always helping out, but not in a direct way. And therefore we are community, again, community oriented with these different business models. Yeah. Wolfgang, I know that Fennings does also have a food box delivery, right, in, in Kitchener-Waterloo. Do you know the numbers for that? My sister does that. That's my sister's business. Mm -hmm. And they have online shopping through their store that they have. You can go on the website and just, yeah, online order and they deliver it. Uh, it's a very well-functioning system. Do you know how many yeah. customers? I don't exactly know the, the numbers, uh, but it's quite popular. Yeah, I expect it's probably been high since last year with COVID, right? Yes, everybody is trying to go on to online shop. And then you, we are trying to figure out which is the better model. Either the consumer drives his car to the store or a van drives around to deliver something. And what I'm finding is um same as now all the couriers come around like fedex and perlator and all the the amazon delivery vehicles i don't know which it would be a very interesting study for somebody to find out what does it how much fuel does it take 
to move into a certain community things by the distribution vein centers the Amazon system or everybody driving to the store themselves. I don't know what is the more economical. I know yes. in the greenhouse industry, for example, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers is okay because you can vertical grow. But if you would grow lettuce in a greenhouse, it would be, it would take less fuel to grow the, the lettuce in the desert in California and truck it here versus growing the lettuce in the greenhouse that you need to pay off to the bank for. So this is why nobody's growing greenhouse lettuce here. Mm. Wow, interesting. Uh, we should let you get back to work soon, but maybe a final question. I'm curious, you know, given the fact that you've been, it's, you've been an organic farmer all these years, what have you noticed about changes in the ecology and the soil quality? Is it becoming more difficult? Or are you becoming more adept at kind of maintaining soil quality? Any observations kind of on ecological shifts? You know, every year you record what happened, what you did, you make your observations and the next spring comes around and you try to remember hmm, what worked well the year before and what didn't. I'm just making it very, very simple. And then you make a changes and you adapt in order to make the year better than the previous year. So the, the goal is every year to make it better than the year before. Sometimes situations come along that completely throw a wrench in the box and you com completely fail. But over the, over the years, we learned how to manage weeds, how to work with the soil so that the food is there, the quality is there, bricks levels are there. You know, if the carrots taste good, the consumer wants them. And the consumer will go to a store and tell a store that hates us to buy the carrots because he has them. And we have some stores that there are difficult relationships, but the store also is honest enough to say, if I have rosebound carrots on the shelf, the consumer will not buy them. Or as soon as I have your carrots back, I might as well take the earthbound off the shelf because they would never sell. They sit forever. People don't take them just like the cookies. Wow. It, it, you know, you hear that and it sounds nice at the end of the day. On the other hand, there are also farmers at that end struggling to make it work. So. Um, mm. Just in terms of compost, because I know you're a vegetable operation. Are you using animal manure as well? We do get horse manure, which we compost. We get tree leaves, which we compost. We get wood chips, which we feed with vegetable waste because there's a whole science and res recipe. Uh, like compost making is a very, very fascinating science. And it's amazing what you can do with compost and what you can get compost or the compost process to do for you in order to unlock minerals that are in, in an unavailable form and so on. And this we learned to do over the years, which gives us good, uh, good looking and tasting food. So yeah, we learned that over the years, just like a baker plays with his recipe all the time. Yes, I remember you telling me at one point that you could compost a whole cow in five weeks <laughs> if you knew what you were doing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we didn't invent that. We don't do that because we don't have livestock. But yeah. I know from from courses we took what is being done and what is possible. And right. yeah, it's a it's a very uh, what do you care, call it a sustainable way of doing it. If yeah. you can't send it off to dead stock. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Wolfgang. That was like a wide ranging conversation, but a really great snapshot of what you've been up to and all the different implications and um you know and I think what's really stood out for me is just the farming with heart you know making friends and building community and um you know and the challenges of the bottom line in maintaining values right that's yes but I'm delighted that um you're part of this community and I've learned so much from you over the years thank you no problem. And uh, to the class, you're all young people going out. Don't expect the world to wait for you when you're done. 
And when you're out there, it's like in sales, you are selling yourself, me, I'm selling food. And if I'm going to some store, he says, I have three other vendors, I don't need you. Then it is number one, how you take that and how you respond to that, that in the end will open the door, even though the door was closed. If you learn how to open doors, you will be successful. You don't have to be greedy, but if you get the thrill out of opening doors, you'll walk home happy. And I've walked home happy, even though I got thrown out of stores and I was still able to open the door, not by force. You, you, you have to get creative in figuring out intuitively how to open a door. And then you get to a store and don't be shy to give because when you start with giving, you'll be able to receive. But when you go to a business and you think, oh, I have all these conditions that I need to meet, you're young. They say, no, there's five others that, no. You will be able to make it by giving, by being forthcoming. And we have this when young kids come in and they just stand and wait for orders. Well, there's lots of those. So you can, you can make it if you provide that little extra and you don't go bankrupt over it. The reward will be great. Lessons in building relationships. Wisdom from Wolfgang Fenning. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there you go. Thank you, Wolfgang. Talk to you soon, I hope. Yeah, all the best to everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>